Live for God Studio Productions. This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Last week, uh, we began looking at this uh, message within the Sermon on the Mount. And it's a, it's a message which is basically understanding the law. Jesus is pointing out issues of the law, issues about the law. And uh, since this appears to be a collection of messages that Jesus taught, uh, it's, it's not one big, the Sermon on the Mount isn't one big, long uh, message. And it probably should be better called the Sermons on the Mount because it, it, it was a series of messages that he taught. It may have been taught over a series of three or four days, I don't know. But uh, it, anyway, it was, it was a series of messages. And it happened on the uh, north side of the sea. You can see in the picture there, the, uh, we don't know if this was the exact location, uh, but that's the general area of the, it was kind of the northwest part of, of the Sea of Galilee. And when Jesus taught, it was just, it was crowded. I mean, there were people everywhere. I mean, it was thousands of people around him. And, uh, and how he did it without a PA system and, and Tyler and Greg and those guys working the sound system, I don't know. But he did it, and people heard him, and people responded. And uh, I'm getting just a little ring up here. Um, the theme of this series on understanding the law is the law can't fix why you need the law. Now remember, Jesus was dealing with some people who were really into the law. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees would push the law and push In fact, they'd make up their own laws on top of, of, the, of the Torah. And they'd push these laws and they'd tell the people, you've got to do this law if you're going to be right with God, if you're going to be holy, if you, if you expect God to, to respond to you. And Jesus was going, and, and earlier in his message, he already addressed this, he, but he said, what has the law done for you? You've obeyed the law, has it, what has it done for you? Now remember, at the same time that Jesus is teaching this, he's also healing people, and he's meeting their needs, and he's doing something that the Pharisees and the Sadducees could not do. They could not heal people. They would just tell people, you got to do this, and you got to do this, and this is the law, and you got to abide by the law. And so Jesus launches into this series within the Sermon on the Mount of what the laws are, and let's take a look at the laws. And he addresses them by saying, uh, you have heard it said... And then he comes back, but I say to you, and then he expounds on it uh, just a little bit. But Jesus made it very clear uh, in the beginning of this that there was a reason why he was doing this. And this statement that the law can't fix why you need the law is really critical to understanding this. That the law can't fix the problem that causes the reason for the law. In other words, uh, and and we use this example, uh, there is a law against robbing banks. So you're not supposed to rob a bank in this country. But the law doesn't fix the reason why people rob banks. You see my point? So Jesus says we've got to deal with the issue, the real reason why people need the law. And what he's basically saying is the law can't fix the reason for the law, but I can. It is Jesus who can change and address the issues in people's lives. And so that's what he's doing as he goes through these things. He's looking at some of these laws that all of the people understood, and he's giving them, uh, 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 helping them to understand this law doesn't really do anything for you because you need to address the issues for the reason that the law exists. Now, he said earlier in, in his message in Matthew 5, 17, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And what he meant by that was, I've come to do what the law could not do. The law can't fix the issue. The law can't fix the reason why there is a law. But I can. I've come to fulfill what the law can't do. I've come to fix the problem, if you will. Now, what he was saying is, I'm not here to do away with the law. I'm here to fix the reason why we need the law. And and what he was saying is, the law isn't bad in and of itself. It's just not capable of fixing the problem. And then he launches into all of these examples that I mentioned and and talks about the limitations of the law and the whys and the reasons for the law. Now, this would have been incredibly alarming to the Pharisees and Sadducees. And and no doubt there were Pharisees and Sadducees that were some of them that were around. They're just kind of observing what was going on because the word had spread like wildfire about Jesus. 
And so, but this would have been incredibly alarming to them because the law was the center of their universe. It was all about obeying the law. But Jesus was speaking truth, and there was nothing that they could do about it. He would speak the law, he'd tell them about the law, and then he'd point why the law wasn't good enough, why the law didn't solve the problem. And that was driving them nuts. Now remember that at the time that he was doing this, he's healing people. So something that the Pharisees and Sadducees couldn't do, and this was really intimidating to them. Last week, we looked at the first three laws that Jesus commented on. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, and don't get a divorce for the wrong reason. And as he addressed those three things, he gave him the reasons why those laws were needed, but he said, what we have to do is fix the reason for the law. And I want to take, because the issue of divorce, many of you uh, commented on it after class, and I thought, I, I probably should expound just a little bit more on this. Uh, because it's important for us to understand what the Bible really does teach about the issue of divorce. Either we've gone through divorce, or somebody in our family has gone through divorce, or we have friends that have gone through divorce. All of us have been affected in some way or another by divorce. And so what we're addressing just for a few minutes is what Jesus said in Matthew 5.31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And as we established last Sunday, what he was saying was uh, that a woman who is kicked out, a man kicks her out and commits adultery, uh, 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 it says he wants a divorce, and there were a couple of different ways that they did it. One, they would get a, 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 a written order from the, the high priest that would say, or from the priest of the temple that would give, tell them that, okay, you're now divorced, and so it was announced, and it was read publicly, and, and that's how it was handled. It wasn't a government thing. The government the divorce and marriage didn't become an issue with the government until the 1700s, I think it was here, or maybe, maybe a little earlier, but that was about when it happened in the United States, for example. So it wasn't even a, a government issue. It was always a church issue. Ma marriage was always dealt with in the church. And the same thing was true in this particular culture of Jesus' time. All of these things were dealt with by the church, and so it was the church that decided whether or not the divorce was legitimate or you could get a divorce. There was one other school of thought uh, by, by one of the, uh, the Pharisee groups was that all you had to do, and it was the man who, could, who, who would claim the divorce, not the woman, that the man would clap his hands three times. I don't know if it was out of joy or what, but anyway, he'd, he'd clap his hands and say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and then you, know, you were automatically divorced. The problem with that was that the woman, who, because it was a patriarchal society, it was the woman, and if she had children, it was even more difficult, couldn't really support herself. So she would need to get married again. And so what, what Jesus is saying is, look, if you force, other than sexual immorality, if you force a woman to have to get married, you're basically forcing her to be unfaithful to you. She committed herself to you, and you divorced her, right? so you're, you're forcing her to be unfaithful. So it's the analogy that he's drawing. And so the man that she marries then is kind of forced into this situation also. And, it's, and what Jesus is saying is, you're just complicating it with your law. You're just, you're, just, you're just spinning this web that makes it so difficult. The problem in America today with, with divorce and churches with divorce is that we've taken the law and we've applied it. And we've tried to make it work for us in our culture today. And so now there's this stigma and people are dealing uh, and lives are broken by divorce. And, and they're hurting. And people, some of you in this class are hurting because of a divorce. And it may have happened years and years and years ago, but you still deal with it. You still, and if there are children involved, even more so. So I want us to take a, a few moments about this. Jesus never forbade divorce. This is really important to understand. Jesus doesn't forbid divorce. He just says, don't get a divorce for the wrong reason. By the way, same thing is true for marriage. You shouldn't get married for the wrong reason. And by the way, getting, being in love isn't the right reason for getting married. There's a lot of people in love who should not get married. There's only one reason, and I, and I tell couples when I'm doing premarital counseling, I tell them this, there's only one reason for getting married, and that is because it's God's will. That's the only reason. It's not because you love each other. It's obvious that you love each other. But the question is, is it God's will? And then I ask both of them, tell me, 
why you believe this person is God's will for you. Oh, because she's so beautiful and so forth and so on. And then the second question is, tell me why you think you're God's will for her. Ooh, well, that's a little different. Uh, but it's important for us to understand that. There's really only one reason for getting married, because it's God's will. That's it. And that will, that will solve a whole lot of issues that we run into when we run into marriage. You know, because, let's face it, love changes. People's feelings for each other change. But when you've got a commitment that you made to the Lord, and by the way, marriage is a, is a, is a covenant between you and the other person and the Lord. And when you've made a covenant, you understand that. And you, you stick to that. But Jesus is not forbidding divorce. And he's just saying, don't get a divorce for the wrong reason. No marriage is perfect because none of the people in marriage are perfect. Now, one of you may think you're perfect, but that means you're not. <laughs> and marriages change and adapt because the people in the marriage change and adapt. You know, it's, it's like when, you know, guys, when your wife says, you're not the person I married. Don't say you're not either. I will tell you right now. <laughs> I will tell you from personal experience, that's not the right answer. <laughs> but sometimes marriages fail because someone or both people in the marriage fail. Now, failure is not a reason for divorce. Some failures can be overcome. But it's what those failures cause that become the reason for the divorce. Sometimes those failures cause adultery. Sometimes those failures cause what the Bible refers to as fraud in a marriage when one person or both people intentionally don't live up to their commitment uh, to each other. That's fraud, and that's, by the way, a, a biblical grounds for, for divorce. Uh, and Jesus' point is that there is only one person who can fix that, and it's him. That's why we need Jesus in our marriages, because he can fix the problem. He can fix the reasons why we consider divorce. And it doesn't always happen that way. He can't always fix it because there are some issues that can't be overcome. But the point is that while God allows for divorce under certain circumstances, what Jesus is saying is let's, let's not get all hung up with the law on this. Let's find out what the problem is and fix the problem. Many early translations of the Bible quote Malachi 2.16 as saying that God hates divorce. It's a bad interpretation. It's a bad translation. In fact, if you've got a Bible that's been translated within the last, well, probably 10, 15 years, it doesn't say that. Uh, Malachi 2.16 says this, For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. So don't get hung up on the idea that God is mad at you because of your divorce. He's not. Look at divorce the way that God looks at it. How does God look at divorce? How does he see it? Uh, Marcia and I had a son who went through a divorce. And just watching the pain and the hurt, uh, incredible hurt, the sorrow that he went through was gut-wrenching for us. Thank goodness there were no children involved. But just, just that divorce between those two people and no children involved was gut-wrenching. And it really, Marcia and I were talking about this yesterday, it really helped us to understand uh, the reason that God doesn't will divorce, doesn't want divorce, because, he, because of what it does to his children. Seeing what that did to our son helped us understand, man, if it, if it hurt him so much, I can understand why God doesn't want that for us, because it hurts so much. A divorce is not... Two people going their separate ways. Remember, the Bible talks about when you get married, it's two become one. And so divorce is the butchering of one person who go their separate ways. And it's so incredibly painful. It's difficult to understand that. It's difficult to understand that, that God doesn't will it for, for our benefit. He doesn't want us to hurt he doesn't want us to be wounded. Now, if you've gone through a divorce, you need to know that God doesn't will divorce because he loves you so much that he doesn't want you to hurt. And if you're still struggling with that divorce, here's what you need to do. 
Remember that you're a child of God. And your heavenly Father sees you as a child. And this is what he wants you to do. He wants you to crawl up in his lap. Let him put his arms around you. Let him love you. And let him tell you that he's sorry you hurt so bad. And then just spend some time and let him hold you for a while. Your heavenly father wants you to do that. Because he knows you hurt. And he wants to hold you because you're hurting. In the same way that you would do that for your child. And God spoke through Jeremiah of his love for his children when they go through loss and when they go through crisis. He refers to that trauma as a sword. It's in Jeremiah 31. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Now look at what this verse is saying about the crisis, the hurt, the pain, the loss that you go through in your life. This is really important to understand. Uh, The idea is when you go through the sword in your life, when you're under the sword in your life, no matter what the crisis is, when you're under the sword in your life, you're in a desert, just like Israel was. You're in this desert, and all of a sudden, you're under the sword, and you're in a desert, and it seems like God is nowhere near, and all you want is you just want to rest. I want to get away from this. I just want to rest. I I, I want to be able to, to separate myself from this problem. And I love what God says here. He says, you find yourself in a desert under a sword, and the Lord appears from far away. Sometimes in our lives, when we're under a sword, it just seems like God is so far away, doesn't it? And it just seems like we're out there in the desert by ourselves, and all we want is we just want to rest. We want to get away from this problem. And that verse says, look at this, that God appeared from far away. God came looking for Israel. It's true in your own life, too. When you find yourself under a sword and you're in the desert and you just need some rest, cry out to God and he will appear to you. In other words, he'll start, he'll move closer to you. He'll come looking for you. And he gives this incredible reason. I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's why he does it. He loves you with an everlasting love. And because he loves you with an everlasting love, he has continued his faithfulness to you. Isn't that an amazing statement? Don't you want to hear God say that to you? I've loved you with an everlasting love. And because of that, therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. I want you to understand something. You may have gone through a divorce, but God did not divorce you. You may have lost a loved one, but you did not lose God. You may have gone through a failure, but God did not fail you. You may be in the middle of a major crisis in your life, but God is still in control. He has loved you with an everlasting love, and therefore he continues his faithfulness to you. 2 Thessalonians 3 says this, But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. When you find yourself at that time when you're out in the desert and you're under the sword and there's a crisis in your life and you're struggling and it may have happened years ago and you're still struggling with it and you're, you're dealing with some guilt and you're dealing with, with some hurt and you're dealing with, with uh, issues of justice and all of, those thing, all of those things, you're under the sword and even if it happened a long time ago, understand that you are vulnerable and the evil one will attack you when you are most vulnerable. And God says, if you will trust me, if you will trust me, I'll deal with that. 
I will deal with that. I will establish you and I will guard you. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.